Hello, and welcome to Word Talk, CTN's look at the political scene in Ann Arbor. I'm your host, Bonnie Gabowitz. We'll be discussing issues and solutions with the city council members from our five wards on the third Wednesday of each month. Joining us is Chip Smith from Ward 5. Welcome, Chip. And I haven't seen you in a whole year, so it's a, it's a delight to see you. It's and great to be back. You know, I, I really enjoy coming in. And, and, and you and don't talking. look a day older. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I feel about 10 years older, but, you know, I, it's very nice of you to say. So let's start with Ward 5, because I know every ward has something special going on. And you do have something new that's going on in your ward. We do. And this is a pretty exciting thing for me, because I've been a, a real champion of pedestrian and bicycle safety. And that was a big reason why I ran for council the first time in 2015. And, and at council uh, last week, we passed a, a project uh, unanimously, the People Friendly Streets Project. And it, it is actually two different projects downtown. And, and the first part of this project, which will start next summer, is the conversion of the first and Ashley Street one-way streets. Both of those will become two-way traffic streets. You know, uh, well, do you know if they were ever two-way streets? They were. The, so, so a lot of the downtown streets, and, and first and Ashley were converted in the 60s during the attempted downtown bypass with, with Beeks and, and Packard uh, to try and move traffic more quickly. You know, lots of communities did that during the urban renewal period in the 60s, a miserable failure for many, many downtowns. We've never converted back. And you know we had a, an engineering group that is really well respected uh, internationally. The tool group out of Minneapolis came in and worked with the DDA and the stakeholders and property owners to do a big study. And I, I think for me, what really clinched it as we have to do this is that you know they looked at all of the crashes over the last four years. And, and, and would you say there was an increase in, in incidents? Uh, there were, I, if, I, if memory serves me correctly, there are 300 some crashes on those two streets over the last four years. And a disproportionate number of those involve vulnerable users. That's bicyclists and pedestrians. Uh, and then the injuries that result from those crashes, uh, you know, again, disproportionately injured vulnerable road users, which is we're trying to get away from that. We have this Vision Zero policy that we believe that we can end traffic-related fatalities uh, in the city in the next, you know, seven years, and that's our, that's our goal. Uh, and so when you look at all of this information, and, and really what clinched this for me as a no-brainer for us to do on First and Ashley is when they looked at the number of cars that expe uh, exceeded the 25 mile an hour speed limit on those two roads, 40% uh, of all cars were speeding. Over 100, That's a, a, lot. Over 100 a day were going more than 40 miles an hour. And that's that's well, forty miles an hour is pretty fast for an Ann Arbor City street. Well, oh, absolutely, it's a twenty-five mile an hour speed limit. But what's really important about that forty mile an hour total is if if you are a pedestrian or a bicyclist and you are struck by a car that's going twenty miles an hour, you survive ninety percent of the time. If you are a bicyclist or a pedestrian struck by a car going forty miles an hour, your chances of surviving are ten percent. So that, to That's me, was an absolute no-brainer to do this. Uh, and that passed unanimously. The other part that passed unanimously was, um, as part of what's called the People Friendly Streets Project, the DDA had the, the tool group also look at Huron Street from uh, 3rd and Chapin uh, all the way up to state and look at that corridor. How do we make that more pedestrian friendly? How do we make it more welcoming? How do we make it more people scaled rather than a, a thoroughfare right through the heart of our downtown. And what I've noticed about Huron Street is that we have a lot of trucks driving on that street as well as cars. We do. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it is the 94 business route, so it is designed to, to carry truck traffic. But some of what we found out is that during off-peak hours, uh, you know, between uh, 9 and 3 uh, every day, you know, Huron doesn't carry the volume of traffic that would necessitate the lane configuration that we have. So part of this uh, process is going to add on-street parking uh, on Huron 
during off-peak hours. And MDOT, of course, has to uh, sign on to this. We still have so, some work to do. So what you're saying is there, there could be limited parking based on what time it time is? Time of day, yes. Uh -huh. That's and, interesting. And I think for, for us in the Fifth Ward, and all of these projects are in the Fifth Ward, uh, you know, the really important change to us is, uh, as part of that Huron project, is we have a hawk signal at the third and Chapin cross intersection of, uh, of Huron, um, you know, out in front of the Y and in front of Lurie mm -hmm. Terrace. And we have heard uh, for a number of years, both from the YMCA and the residents at Lurie Terrace, that that intersection is a real problem for pedestrians. That the hawk signal there, drivers don't always know that they're supposed to stop when it is flashing red. It's a little confusing. The light doesn't last very long. You have traffic from 3rd and from Chapin trying to get across during that time. Uh, part of this project is to put a real signal in there so that we have an actual signalized crossing that will allow people with impaired mobility that are a little bit slower, be they seniors, be they you know, uh, preschoolers, to get across the street and not have to dodge traffic. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is such a huge improvement that I'm really hoping that we can push that through and implement that sooner rather than later. But that's a really exciting part of this for me. I mean, these are mm. two big changes that I've really been advocating for since 2015, and the fact that we are actually going to do them uh, makes me feel that, that we've, we've begun to accomplish some things. So at what stage are you now? Are you waiting for the DDA to fine tune it or so, approve uh, it? So what will have to happen is the two-way conversions will happen next summer, uh, summer of 2019. As part of those projects, uh, the roads will be resurfaced. There's some underground utility work that needs to be done, some uh, water main replacement that'll happen, some s storm sewer work. Uh, when you dig up an old street downtown, there's a lot of stuff that's not where you might expect it to be. So uh, dealing with that is always uh, complicated. Um, but all of that will happen next summer, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, I can't tell you how excited I am for that to, to happen. So, uh, it, so basically, you're looking at uh, your neighborhood, your ward, in, in terms of making it much safer. And it sounds like it might even be easier for the drivers to, it, to work their way through the streets. And Absolutely. You know, and, and this is, you know, that is my neighborhood. Is I, I live not far from, from First and Ashley. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times, particularly during events, whether it's a football game, whether it's art fair, whether it's you know a big cultural event, uh, that you see cars turning the wrong way onto the one-way streets, people getting lost, you know, not really sure how to get someplace. Uh, you have a lot of truck traffic. You, we see a lot of trucks get stuck under the bridge at Washington. Uh, because they they get confused by the one-way streets that don't show up as one-way streets on their GPS and they make wrong turns. Uh, it, it, I think this is just, it makes our streets safer. Mm -hmm. And because it is downtown, downtown really does belong to all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that this is a huge leap forward in the commitment that the city is showing towards making streets for everybody. That's, that's wonderful. Well, I'd certainly look forward to that. And again, uh, I would think the city would be have some kind of informational campaign once they put it in place. Once we get the uh, construction process sorted out and we're getting into it, there will be a, a big education campaign that you know lets everybody know that these streets are converting to mm -hmm. two-way. I mean, both of these streets also have a big residential component as they pass, pass through the old west side. Uh, you know, I, I know those, I've talked to so many people on those two streets in the Fifth Ward that are thrilled for this change mm -hmm. because it is going to reduce speed through the neighborhood. It is no longer going to be seen as a, as a cut through, a fast traffic uh, way to get around downtown. Uh, you know, and so we're going to be doing a lot of education about that. Uh, it will be probably the project next summer that you hear the most about uh, if you're just out and about in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. But, and, and in terms of why it takes so long, uh, what's the big 
reason for that? Because um, that's a year away. Right. It, it, it's because we're doing all the work at once. And the reason that we considered these two projects, the Huron project and the conversion together, was so that we get you know, some better construction pricing uh, so that we are able to do many things at once. And, and, and it's always... Plus it's disruptive. It, to, uh, it is. The, we, we want to yeah. try and... The Huron Street project, if MDOT approves, it won't go forward until 2020. Uh, but as we plan for these things, it is always the city's goal when we do a major construction project like mm -hmm. this, whether it's resurfacing a street or replacing sidewalks or uh, doing utility work, is to coordinate all of that work mm -hmm. so that we don't resurface a street and then dig it up. But that, that happens a lot. DTE does that. I, I have a little bit of a problem with that. We are really really focused on making sure this is all coordinated so that when we're done, we're not digging it up in six months to do some underground work. We're trying to take care of that all at the same time. Great. Well, that's great news about Ward 5. And, and for everybody who goes to downtown, uh, when we come back from our break, I know we just had an election. So we're going to talk about that. Lots okay. to digest. Okay. We want to hear from you, so please email us questions to ctn at a2gov.org or tweet us at hashtag CTN in Arbor. We're going to take a break now and we'll be coming back with more from Ward 5 and the City of Ann Arbor. Hi, I'm Bonnie Gabowitz, and this is Ward Talk. We're talking to Chip Smith from Ward 5, and we just had a wonderful talk about a new project for Ward 5 and the streets. But uh, right now, this being the month of uh, August, we've just had a very important primary election. So I, I really want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> because you have been on the council for a few years now, and there's some new things happening. So first of all, let me ask you about the turnout. Um, how is it different from, let's say, a year and two years ago? You know, the turnout smashed, I think, everybody's expectations. Uh, you know, we're not talking about 70% turnout. I, I think the turnout was in the high 40s, but for an August primary elections when there are no students in town, that's a pretty extraordinary turnout for us. Right. It, it's been relatively a low turnout in August compared to no, November well, I, for, the, pro, for the, the actual. Yeah, I, I'm more versed in the off year uh, mm -hmm. because that's when I had, had run before, you know, and, and our race in the Fifth Ward uh, 2015 and 2017 set records for turnouts in odd years. And, you know, I think we had 20% last year. Uh, and, and this just, just smashed the expectations this year. And, and I think it, it is a lot of pent up frustration about what's happening nationally, what's happening at the state level. Uh, and people are eager to make sure that their voices are heard. And, and so because there was a lot of stuff on the ballot, because there were a lot of really compelling up ticket uh, candidates and races, uh, it brought a lot of people out who have, we saw a huge increase in the number of first time voters uh, in Ann Arbor. And, and I think that that's a positive development for us. Mm -hmm. And we have how many new 
people will now be coming into the council? Uh, well, we, we had three of the incumbents uh, were defeated by challengers this year, so we will have uh, uh, four new council members. Uh, Sumi Kalispathi of the First Ward is retiring, uh, not running for re-election. Uh, there was a Democratic primary uh, on, on the 7th last week. Uh, but there is a challenger, an independent challenger, who is a Democratic Socialist, who is uh, uh, challenging the Democratic candidate in November. That will be a contested race. We're not sure you know, what will happen there. Uh, I expect it to, to be an interesting race. Uh, but we will have four new faces on council next year. And, and does, does the... Does the term start in January or? It starts in November. In November. The right second after meeting the in November, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, for me, I, I'm a little sad because, you know, the three incumbents that are leaving, I think, have been uh, very hardworking and committed public servants uh, that brought a lot of different things to the table. Uh, but change in a community is, is always a, a good thing. And, and I think. Uh, it's how we evolve, and, and change is always a necessary thing. And, and uh, I think as I look forward, I, I have no idea what, what the council makeup will feel like or be like, or, you know, I, I just don't know enough about the individuals to know what their strengths are. And, and I think as we figure that out, you know, the next uh, council that's seated will, will figure out how to work well together. I have a question that just popped in my head. Um, you are, you're, the council members are already in, also involved in certain committees, mm -hmm. uh, such as the, the Human Rights Committee is mm -hmm. an example. Um, when a new council member comes in, do they choose which committee to be involved in, or do they take over? The mayor chooses mm -hmm. who gets assigned, but it is not, I, I wish it were as simple as, Mayor Taylor saying, Chip, I want you to work on Environmental Commission and Transportation Commission and Liquor Licensing Review Board. Uh, we talk about what we're interested in, what our strengths are, you know, uh, what our schedules are, because you know, uh, if you all of a sudden have eight night meetings a month, it's a hard thing to stay married and raise children <laughs> and, and have a job. Uh, but uh, we work together uh, to kind of hash hash out uh, mm -hmm. what is considered a fair workload for everybody uh, and make sure people are, are able to uh, work on the, the topics that are of interest to them uh, and that play to their strengths. And, and the mayor uh, you know, comes up with those nominations uh, with the exception of uh, a couple of uh, commissions that are council appointments. The environmental commission is a council appointment. Uh, we will talk about, you know, we reassign those, all the committee assignments every year. So, uh, so there could be some, a shuffle of... There, there will be a shuffle. Oh, there will you be. know, there, mm -hmm. there is no, uh, you don't just slide into what your predecessor necessarily mm -hmm. did because that might not be Might your not strength. fit you. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, you know, I know what I'm interested in. I'm in, interested in, in environmental stuff. I'm interested in transportation stuff interested in planning stuff, you know, uh, the one thing that I think should probably be as certain is that Council Member Ackerman, so long as he's uh, willing to continue to serve on the Planning Commission, do so. He's done a fantastic job, <laughs> uh, and it is a yeah. ton of work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and so uh, I think we're just going to have a, a discussion as we get to know each other. And, mm -hmm. and you know, that's fun. It's refreshing. It's it's good to change up personalities and skills and, and I think it, it, it will, you know, we will uh, benefit as a community. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so, so whatever is going on now will continue with the council members who are still in place mm -hmm. through the summer into the fall. That's right. Until the, the next election. I mean, even though all of these candidates won Democratic primary races, it's important to keep in mind that there's still a general election where they have to, to get mm -hmm. votes. Mm -hmm. uh, and are we one of the few cities that still uh, present council members uh, in terms of uh, their political party identification? We are. We're one of three cities in Michigan that continues to do that. And I, I think that there has not, there have been different attempts to simply 
eliminate partisan elections in our local uh, body here uh, over the last couple of years, which I understand that and I get that. Uh, you know, one of my concerns about that is I don't think that that necessarily helps what we do. I don't think it helps turnout. I, I think it blurs lines a little bit. But you know, I'd be much more interested in thinking holistically about our whole form of government and rethinking that. If we're going to eliminate something that's been a part of our government for a long time here, mm -hmm. let's think about our ward structures. Do we need two, five wards with two representatives in each ward? Would we better, be better served by 10 wards? Is that or? part of the city charter? Uh, it is, mm -hmm. and I think you know this is uh, a uh, conversation that, that I've been having with uh, soon-to-be outgoing council member Grape, uh, Graydon Crapole mm -hmm. from the fourth ward. Uh, you know, how do we introduce a, a body that, that can provide some advice on, you know, do we take a look at our charter and, and change some of our, our governance rules? Mm -hmm. And I think every community should do that at least once every 10 years to make sure that what you're doing is, is representative of the community that you serve. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we just have not come up with a, a way to do it, and, and the way it's been attacked uh, by different members of council trying to eliminate nonpartisan elections, and we did it in a kind of piecemeal fashion going mm -hmm. from the two-year to the four-year term, uh, you know, last year or two years ago when the voters decided that. I think it benefits us to take a broad, holistic look at this mm -hmm. rather than let's try this and see if it does this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the ultimate goal is to get more participation. Uh, and I think that, that we need to take a look at more than just the partisan part of our elections to, to figure out you know, how to do that. Mm -hmm. And we have just a few minutes left, and I know there's something going on that I wasn't aware of called the Unified Development Code. Uh, if you could give us so, a, a uh, little hint <laughs> as to what that's yeah, all about. People watching at home might have heard us talk about this before, it's ZORO, the Zoning Ordinance Reorganization Project. And this has been going on for a number of years now. Uh, and what it does is take all of our different regulations that we have in different ordinances in the city, whether it's zoning, whether it's parking, whether it's streets, whether it's utilities, everything that affects development is now part of the Unified Development Code. So if you are a homeowner looking to do an addition, you can figure out what you need to do. If you are a developer looking at a piece of property, it's all very clear what those steps are, what the process is. Uh, it did not fundamentally alter our zoning ordinance, but it ha now has it set up so that planning commission can start tackling uh, the changes that I think would be appropriate in our zoning ordinance. And they're going to look at lots of different things because I think as we talk about some of our housing needs, mm -hmm. uh, as we talk about some of our uh, needs to have more pedestrian friendly streets. Uh, you know, a lot of these things are determined by what's in the zoning code. A and there are lots of parts of our zoning code that, you know, result in spaces that we don't like here in Ann Arbor. And, and we have to take a look at those. And, and we can't be afraid to have that dialogue. I think it's really critically important to talk about well, we're getting buildings we don't like because our code says that you can build this building that it, we don't like. And if it's in the zoning, if, if within the parameters of what the zoning laws are, if a builder comes and says, I want this kind of building, and it's within that framework, you can't say no, right? Not, you, uh, not without being subject to lawsuit. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so the, that, tie, that really ties you. It does. Yeah. The, the, bigger the project, the bigger the potential lawsuit and loss. And, and you can look at communities across Michigan that, that have rejected by right zoning projects mm -hmm. and were sued. The project goes, the de developer tends to win those suits. Uh, the project goes ahead as it was presented and then the city is on the hook for millions, millions of dollars. Of dollars and, yeah. and so, you know, we have to exercise great prudence in that. And, and if our zoning isn't doing what the community wants it to, then we need to have that conversation to change that part of our zoning ordinance. Mm -hmm. And I would think the citizens of Ann Arbor would be very interested in, in that particular part of, of what you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the, the discussion this summer has really focused a lot on affordability, which I think is great that we are finally 
really taking a serious look at that. But mm -hmm. the zoning ordinance is a big part of, of how we do this. And if we are only going to allow single family detached houses and, and two and three story buildings, we're not going to build supply to, to bring down the cost of housing. Right. And I understand th there was a new, uh, the, there were people who can now apply to have, let's say, a mother-in-law uh, part of the house and have a separate, you know, area of living, mm -hmm. but they, they have certain things they have to follow through on. It, it's called it's an accessory dwelling unit, right. uh, up to 600 square feet of living space mm -hmm. uh, that you can do in certain zoning districts. The property owner has to live on the property either in the main house or in the accessory unit. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not had any since we uh, adopted this regulation about 18 months ago. And, uh, you know, one of the city's treasures, a woman named Jess Lita, who runs a Facebook group called Yimby, Yes in My Backyard, that's really committed to, you know, figuring out how to create more housing, is running this week a series of, of workshops on, uh, she calls it ADU Palooza. And she is an architect uh, and designer by training. Uh, and she had a session a couple of nights ago at the public library, you know, talking to interested people who mm -hmm. want to or want to do an accessory dwelling unit that have the ability to do that, to understand what you have to do, understand where are the hurdles and the roadblocks, you know, and, and I'm hoping that that she can take what she learned and come back to us as council and say, hey, this is what we heard. So let's just make sure on this show that people know that they can look into that. There are things they can do maybe uh, to have more, you know, a, a more affordable housing for their relatives, for their friends, whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I would give the plug here that if, if your uh, viewers are on Facebook uh, and they look up Ann Arbor Yimby, Y-I-M-B-Y, -Y, okay. uh, you can join it. It's an open group and you can get links to all of these things in there. There's great discussion about housing there. Uh, well, we've run out of time. It's hard to I'm, believe. I know, but it's so great that we can talk in depth with a few of these subjects, and you certainly enlightened us on what's going on. And I look forward to seeing you again, uh, and not a year older, but a year younger. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> I can't wait to come back. I love being able to sit down and talk about this stuff. Great. Remember to join us for a new episode every third Wednesday of the month. We want to hear from you, so please email us at ctn at a2gov.org, attention, word talk. You can also follow us at ask quest and ask questions on Twitter at twitter.com slash ctn in Arbor. We'll make sure to include your questions. For Word Talk, I'm Bonnie Gabowitz. Until next month.